My name is Chris Phillips, and I am an Associate Professor of Philosophy here at SUU, and I'd like to talk to you today a little bit about critical thinking. As a philosopher, I think it's useful to start with some idea of what exactly it is that we're going to be talking about, talk about why we want to do it, and then talk about how to do it. So that's the structure of how I'm going to approach things today. As I mentioned, we're talking about critical thinking. So what exactly is critical thinking? Well, critical thinking is one of the things that we try to assess as teachers here at Southern Utah University. And at least the way that we describe it typically is that it's a habit of mind that is characterized by the comprehensive exploration of ideas, uh, by exploring artifacts or evidence before formulating some sort of conclusion. That's how it's described generally as a learning outcome for most of your classes. However, I like to think of critical thinking a little bit more broadly. It, to my mind, critical thinking is an activity and it is a habit of mind, but it's a little bit more than just considering evidence and, and weighing options before coming to a conclusion. It requires us to stop and kind of think about our own thoughts to reflect on the methods that we have for why we're coming to particular conclusions. And so in that way, it requires a little bit more than merely evaluating evidence or weighing evidence. It's something that's more reflective. When I think about critical thinking, I think about it in terms of rationality, applying reason. But as I said, it's not just the application of reason, it's a reflection upon the kinds of ways in which we reason. And I think that it's useful to think about a concept that I like to call reasonableness. Reasonableness, as I understand it, is a kind of more restrictive form of rationality. Rationality, of course, is this application of reason. But reasonableness, I think, has three main parts. To be reasonable, you need to be responsive to others to the reasons that they're going to give you, to their perspectives, to the evidence that they provide you, and to think about the kinds of things that they're saying. Now, of course, in order to do that, you have to understand them first. And when we understand people and why they believe what they believe, then we can really kind of move on to the second piece of being reasonable, which to my mind, again, is to be open to being influenced by their perspectives. When we're open to being influenced by the perspectives of others, then it's not necessarily accepting what they have to say as being true, but it's a, a sort of willingness to entertain what you understand them to be saying or believing. Finally, uh, the, the last component of reasonableness is being open to adjusting your own views, to changing your mind or to even abandoning the views that you held before, the beliefs that you had, in light of this new understanding that you have of the people that you're talking to. Now, a central part of this, of course, is gonna be dialogue with others. You can't come to understand what others are saying if you're not listening, if you're not talking with them, if you're not actively engaged in asking questions and reflecting on how they might have come to have these kinds of positions. I think that this is really valuable and this is really important. And that's roughly what critical thinking is, at least as far as I understand it. So just to kind of recap that part of it, critical thinking, at least what it is, is this reflective way of thinking about why we're thinking the things that we do, why it is that we come to have the beliefs that we have, what sort of evidence counts as good or bad evidence, and then coming to tentative conclusions, being open to revising them at, later, at a later point when we have more information. That's what I think critical thinking is. Now, why is critical thinking important? Well, again, as a philosopher, I like to sort of explore these why questions. And I think one of the reasons that, that critical thinking is so important comes from one of my favorite philosophers, a 17th century philosopher by the name of Rene Descartes. And he said that having a good mind is important, but it's much more important to apply it well. And especially as someone who's going through higher education, as someone who's coming to, to college for whatever reason it is that you're coming to college, 
it's really, really important that we pay really careful attention to how we are applying our knowledge. Part of education, of course, is gaining more content knowledge. That's maybe the easiest part. That's maybe what it means to have a good mind. But again, we have to apply it well. Now, why do we have to apply it well? Why is that so important? Why would Descartes think that that's important as an educated person to apply this knowledge well? Well, I think of it this way. As we continue in higher education, we specialize more and more. This is what it means to have a major. You take upper level classes and you're narrowing the field of expertise. You are becoming an expert in a particular area. The more expertise that you gain, the fewer people there are in the world who know the things that you know. Now that being said, a lot of people view education as a way to prepare you for a profession. And I think that in some ways that's correct. It's important. But in other ways, it's also just training you how to, how to think and how to be a person. But let's take, let's take this, common, this common view that education is in some sense preparing you for a profession. This ties back in with what I said a moment ago about the narrowing specialization. In being prepared for a particular profession, you're choosing that as a course of action for yourself. Okay? A way to live, a way to be, a way to make money, of course. Now, an important part of this is that you leave here with specialized skills, right? This is that narrowness again. As you gain more and more skills, there are fewer and fewer people who are able to check up on you. And so it's really important for you to understand and be able to apply all of this content knowledge that you've gained, to be able to take all of that and make sense of it on your own, to, to use your mind well to solve problems, to address situations that are novel, to deal with new kinds of situations. This is, I think, part of what Descartes was talking about. I want to take a moment and just sort of pause and I want to talk a little bit about what it means to have a profession. Again, as a philosopher, I get excited about the words and, and what they mean and how they work. And of course, to have a profession is to have a career or to have a job or something like this. But the word profession originated in medieval Europe. And the idea behind a profession was that you would express to the public that you take on this responsibility as an educated individual, as a specialist in a particular area. And you make a profession, that is you profess, you, you tell the public that in light of your education, in light of your expertise, in light of your experience, you are going to live at a higher level of virtue. You are going to be the kind of person who thinks carefully through all of these issues, all of these respons responsibilities that come along with being an educated person. Now, of course, uh, this is all very theoretical and abstract. Let's put it maybe in a little bit easier way to think about it. If you're familiar at all with comic books, in Spider-Man, Uncle Ben says to Spider-Man, with great power comes great responsibility. A lot of us think that knowledge is power. And if knowledge is power, then knowledge comes with responsibility. And that's exactly what this discussion of professionalism is, of the profession. Because with our education, you gain all of this new knowledge. And you gain knowledge that most people in the world do not have. And so you have a responsibility to be able to think carefully and critically and sort of address and make sense of all of these different kinds of things on your own. It's one thing, as Descartes said, to know lots of things, to have a good mind. It's another thing to apply it. And it's much more important to apply it. And this is why critical thinking is so important. So to go back to that idea of reasonableness that I was talking about just a little bit ago when we were trying to define critical thinking. To think about that, to be responsive to others, to recognize that you have a specialized skill, that you have a specialized knowledge set, 
that you know things that lots of other people don't, but to still be open and reflective and to recognize that it's possible to be wrong, to be receptive to the ideas of others, and to be willing to revise in light of new information is really, really important. And that's why we care so much about critical thinking. Because regardless of what you do after you leave college, you need to be able to apply the knowledge that you get here to the world. Whether it's to make it better for yourself, to make it better for others, you need to be able to do this. So that's the why. We have the what. How exactly do we do this? How do we, how do we think critically? How do we think critically in the classroom? How do we think critically outside of the classroom? Well, in some ways, making sense of the what can help us make sense of how. Again, as a philosopher, we'll start at a theoretical level and then we'll boil it down to hopefully some simple tools that we can employ in our day-to-day -day life in order to try to make sense of how we can actually do it. I think that in the context of education, critical thinking is usually involves dialogue. Uh, whether that's dialogue between professors and students, whether that's dialogue between students, whether that's dialogue between faculty and administration, between professors themselves, whatever. There are lots of different ways in which dialogue occurs. Dialogue occurs in the classroom. Dialogue occurs out on the quad. Dialogue occurs between uh, published articles. In fact, this is how scholarly work advances. Faculty have these vetted ideas that they try out and they put out there and then they're constantly challenged. And dialogue is central, as I said, to the very concept of reasonableness. So dialogue is central to the concept and to the practice and to the application of our critical thinking. That's what it is. Dialogue is occurring at all of these different levels. So how do we have a dialogue that results in some sense of reasonableness, in this sort of importance to critical thinking? You might hear the phrase critical thinking and think that it's just this aggressive sort of criticism. But I hope that's not the case. And when I engage in a dialogue with my students or my colleagues, I try really hard not to be aggressive. It's all about your mindset. When we think about critical thinking, when we think about what we're doing as academics in different fields or in the same field, an important part of what we're after is we're all trying to figure out how the world works. Or in some cases, how the world ought to work, how it should, what we want out of the world, how to make the world a better place, something like that. How to make our way in the world. So we all have this common goal. We're all trying to get to the right answers. We're all trying to get to the truth. And when we think about our dialogue in terms of this common goal, this common purpose, the idea that what we want is to try to get closer and closer to the truth, to try and do more, to try and work together to get there. I think this is really important and helpful for a, su a successful dialogue. It, it can still be fiercely critical, the dialogue can. And in fact, it should be. There's an old idiom that iron sharpens iron, right? The only way you're gonna make something stronger is by challenging it with something that's really, really powerful. And so in this way, it can seem, dialogue in an academic context can seem very individualistic. It can seem very focused. It can seem very directed and pointed and adversarial, but it isn't in its best form at least. It isn't adversarial. It's about pressing things to see where there are weaknesses and then trying to strengthen those weaknesses together because we all have this common goal. We're all trying to get to the truth. We're all trying to find the right thing. And so that's how we engage in a rigorously critical, whereby critical in this case, I mean criticizing. We criticize ideas to see whether they can stand up to it. 
That's how you have a rigorously critical dialogue. An important aspect of that, a practical aspect of that, is recognizing that when we criticize ideas, we're not criticizing the person who holds the ideas. We're criticizing the ideas themselves. Again, this ties back to that idea of reasonableness that I started off talking to you about. The idea there, again, is just we need to be open and receptive to new ideas, new information, new evidence, and be willing to, based on our understanding of this new information, adjust our positions to maybe change our mind as need be. When we recognize that we are not identical with our ideas, that we are not merely our ideas, it becomes much easier to recognize a criticism of an idea as just that, as a criticism of an idea or a belief or something like that, rather than a criticism of you as a person. And that's really, really important. I can't stress that enough. If somebody criticizes something that you believe, it's not a criticism of you, because we're all wrong about everything all the time, and that's okay. That's how we learn, that's how we get better. But we have to sort of shift our mindset so that we recognize and think about things in this way. I mentioned Descartes before, René Descartes, the 17th century French philosopher. And I said that this quote from him, that it's one thing to have a good mind, and it's a, a much more important thing to apply it. I think that that's really important. And I want to take a moment also to speak a little bit about his understanding of the nature and importance of education, because I think it's very instructive. And it ties in nicely with our concept of reasonableness. It ties in with our understanding of why we engage in critical thinking. And it's going to give us some clues about how we might engage with critical thinking ourselves. So Descartes was trained in, as I mentioned, 17th century France. He was trained in the Jesuit tradition, and it was much, it was really just kind of lectures. So you had people who professed to be experts, who merely gave you information, and you were a passive receptacle of that information. And he found that very dissatisfactory in a lot of ways. And I think he was right to, to find it that way. Because an important part of education, as I've been trying to stress to you, is this activity, this activity of dialogue, this activity of reflection, and exercising these capacities so that you can develop this habit of mind whereby you become more reasonable. You're thoughtful, you're reflective, you're thinking about evidence, you're weighing the evidence, and these sorts of things. He also found, he being Descartes, also found that at the end of the day, you always have to come back to your own judgment. You are the final arbiter of what it is that you believe. You have to decide things for yourself. You have to weigh the evidence. You have to think through all of the things that are going on. The faculty at this university or any other are experts in their fields. They are incredibly good scholars, they are well read, and they have a lot of information to share with you. But that doesn't mean that they have all the answers. I don't have all the answers. My colleagues don't have all the answers. And quite frankly, the right answers are hard to come by. This is why it's really important that we engage in this dialogue. We engage in this dialogue because you shouldn't be passive receptacles of, of information. You should take in the sorts of things that these experts are telling you. And you should listen to them and, th and reflect on it why are they telling you these things? Are they right? What exactly is it that they're trying to get you to believe and why are they trying to get you to believe it? And so this ties back in, I think, with some of the, the practical side of critical thinking. And it ties back in with that understanding of dialogue, the importance of recognizing that we're all looking for the right answers together, that we're looking for the truth, that we're trying to figure out how to fit in with the world. We want all of that. And your professors can be really helpful in getting you there. But at the end of the day, you, when you're done with your education, are the one who has to make the, the decisions on your own. 
you won't always have faculty there to appeal to, to ask what is the right answer. You might have books. I hope you have books. And Descartes said of books, while he was talking about his education, that reading books from great authors is like having a dialogue with the greatest minds of the past. And I've always liked that. He notes, of course, they're fairly rehearsed dialogues and the, the other folks, the, the books, what they've written are presumably their thoughts in their best form rather than just thoughts off the top of their head. Nonetheless, it is still a dialogue that you're having with them. But since it's a rehearsed dialogue and since it's a self-contained dialogue, even if there are answers in there, you don't really get to ask the questions you want. And so this ties it back. You have to, you have to be in a position to be able to think about all of the things that are going on. Not just take in knowledge, but reflect on the knowledge and see how it all hangs together. See if it makes sense. Evaluate it. Check it. Check why it is that you think some things seem right and why they don't. Because at the end of the day, you are the one who is going to be the possessor of knowledge. You are going to be the professional. You're going to be the one out there trying to solve problems. You are going to be the one who has to make all of these determinations. So what are some concrete things that we can practice, that we can engage in, in order to think critically? Well, unsurprisingly, I'm going to say dialogue. Talk to one another. Talk to your faculty. Go visit them during office hours. Uh, talk to your colleagues. Talk to their colleagues. Ask questions in class. Do not be afraid to engage in this dialogue. If you don't understand something, not just content-wise, but why that something is going on, ask why. I think that's really important. I think we lose a lot of that these days. People just kind of go with the flow. Keep asking why. Engage in that dialogue. Be critical in the sort of rigorously critical sense that I mentioned before. If something doesn't seem right, if it doesn't pass the smell test, if it smells a little fishy, ask some questions. Raise some objections. That's really important. One of the coolest things about being in a university, being in college in general, is that you're surrounded by experts in different areas. And in addition to being surrounded by experts in lots of different areas, you're also surrounded by really intelligent people who are asking similar questions and thinking about similar things. Take advantage of that. Engage in these dialogues. Engage in these maybe fiercely critical at times discussions, but remain respectful and open to changing your position if they give you something new that sounds right, if they present you with some new evidence that undercuts something you already believe. Be willing to think through those sorts of things. This is all incredibly reflective. That's the key part of critical thinking is this reflective knowledge of the world around you. A couple other hints, concrete tips maybe. As we reflect on these, this information that comes in, you have to check it against your own lived experience. People may try to convince you of things that don't match up. And if they don't, don't just take their word for it. Again, this is where that dialogue comes back in. But think, does this actually fit with my life? Does this fit with my experiences? Does this tie in? Does this make sense? Does this cohere and make a, a story that hangs together. And if it doesn't, try to think about why. Is there something in your experience that maybe you've misinterpreted? Or is what they're talking about just misguided? Back to the original definition of critical thinking, the way that the university describes it, remember this is considering different viewpoints before coming to a conclusion. This is also part of reasonableness. Reflecting on your own experiences and reflecting on the experiences of others and seeing if there's some way we can tie them together. It's a difficult thing and it's going to take a lot of practice. But this is how you apply your mind well. Aristotle, the classical Greek philosopher, 
thought that this capacity for reflection and reason is what makes us the kind of things that we are. So it makes us human. We are rational animals. So exercise that capacity, use that capacity. Check the things that people are saying to you against your experiences and see if they fit. And if they don't, work out why. Another really important part of dialogue, as I mentioned, part of reasonableness is understanding others. And understanding can come in a couple of different varieties. It's one thing to understand the content of what someone is saying. If your professor is trying to teach you mathematics and you understand how mathematics works, that's great. It's another thing if somebody is trying to teach you philosophy and you understand the things that I'm saying. You take my class and I try to teach you about Descartes and you understand what I'm saying about Descartes and that's great. You have gained some content knowledge. It's another thing to try and understand why all of these things work. And that's the really difficult part. I'm going to introduce a concept that I typically like, which is interpretive charity. I encourage my students when engaging with one another, when engaging with me, and when engaging with the text to not come to it in a purely critical way. Don't walk in assuming that there's some sort of problem with what they have to say. Try to put yourself in the mindset of someone else. Why would they think this? Why would they, understand, why would they say these sorts of things? Why would they behave in this way? Why would they write this? Well, there must have been some sort of reason. Assume that the person that you're talking to or the person that you're reading, however you're in dialogue with someone, assume that whom, whomever you are in dialogue with is an intelligent person who has reasons and try to figure out what those reasons are. Now, again, this requires more reflective capacity. It's much, much easier to just approach what somebody says and say, yeah, yeah, that sounds dumb. But it's so much more difficult, but so much more valuable to try and understand what it is that they're saying. And so interpreting what they have to say in the best possible way is gonna be a great way to enter into a dialogue and a great way to build the dialogue. Slowing down your thinking is going to be incredibly important when you're, when you're thinking critically. Again, it's very difficult to do this kind of reflective thought. It's exhausting. And there's all kinds of really interesting neuroscience, brain science, about why it is that engaging in reflective thoughts like this uh, is very tiring. It's genuinely, it's physically tiring. It's exhausting. And if you don't believe me, just ask any of my students who have to write philosophy papers. Writing a philosophy paper is physically taxing. It's bizarre. Part of the reason for this is because of evolution, because of the way the brain has evolved. There are different sorts of processing, but we don't need to get into all of that. It's really fascinating, but again, we can save that for another time. The point here is that it's very, very easy to slip into quick judgments, making determinations very quickly and ignoring something because it doesn't fit. We have to take the time. We have to slow down and reflect and engage in these kinds of discussions, these difficult discussions with ourselves and with others. And others can always help us think about the things we're thinking about on our own, which is that importance of dialogue again, that collaborative dialogue, all aimed at the same goal. Something else, finally, to keep in mind is what in my logic class I introduce as something called the total evidence requirement. The total evidence requirement is a requirement that's applied to arguments. When we're thinking about reasons people are giving for why they believe certain things, why they say certain things, why they do certain things, for the sorts of claims that they're making or trying to convince you of, it's sometimes really easy to, again, sort of jump to a quick conclusion and to ignore certain pieces of evidence, to ignore some sort of support for an argument or a position. And in ignoring that, to leave out something really important that can help you understand 
or that can help you reason or that can help you come to a different conclusion. And so taking into account that we don't have access to all of the evidence. We're getting more and more of it all the time, especially as we specialize in our disciplines, especially as we become more and more professional, as we learn more, as we gain more, we come to have more evidence. Whether we'll ever, ever have all of it is, uh, I don't know, a difficult question to answer. But we want to try to take in as much evidence as possible, try to learn as much as we possibly can, and again, all of these things sort of tie back to that concept of reasonableness that I opened with when we were talking about what critical thinking is. To be reasonable is to be rational, but more so, right? It requires more. It requires you to be open-minded. It requires you to listen and understand and to understand why, not just the content, but the why. Why is that content there? Why are we doing this? To reflect on our own methods for coming to truth to engage in dialogue and these sorts of things. So I'd just like to sum, sum it all up and hopefully give you something that's helpful that can aid you as you try to think critically moving on. So what exactly is critical thinking? Well, in my mind, it's a reflective capacity. It's a habit that you engage in that requires you to reflect on the kinds of things that you believe and why you believe them. Critical thinking is a habit of engaging in charitable, open dialogue that is challenging, but co collectively focused. We're all looking for the same thing. We all want the truth. We all want the right answer. And so we can engage in that by having these sorts of discussions. And that's what critical thinking is. Now, of course, as a habit, it's going to take practice. It's not going to be an easy thing to do. We're going to have to try and try and try, and we're going to have to train ourselves over the course of several years. Fortunately, you're in a position at a university where you're surrounded by people who are trying to do the same thing. And you are surrounded by faculty and teachers and mentors who are going to be able to help you do this. That's what we do. That's our job. We are trying to help you become more reflective people. And of course, we're trying to do this because we're trying to prepare you to send you out into the world to be the kind of person who can check your own beliefs and why you believe them and make informed and careful decisions because you're going to be a professional. And again, to go back to the monastic tradition, the monks back in the day in Europe would have to profess that they would live to a higher standard because of the position they were in. And that's what it is for you to be an educated person. For you to be an educated person is to be professing to live according to this higher standard. What is the higher standard? It's critical thinking. It's engaging in this reflective process and thinking carefully and being the kind of person who has these mental habits. And then how do we do that? Again, it's gonna be dialogue. We're gonna engage in this careful dialogue. We're gonna check it against our own background beliefs, our desires, our experiences, and we're going to be willing and open to hearing new perspectives. We're going to weigh those perspectives against our own. We're gonna check it against all of the evidence we have. We're gonna to try to understand the evidence others have. And at the end of the day, we're gonna to come to tentative conclusions that we've accepted on the basis of our reflective awareness of our methods and of our beliefs and of how everything hangs together. It's gonna to take some practice and I wish you the best of luck. Thanks so much for hearing me out and I hope to see you around campus.